Thanks. Thanks everyone for coming to the uh, seminar series. Uh, we got uh, Dr. Pete Rayner and Dr. Jim Marty from the University of Minnesota, and they're going to be uh, talking to us today about environmental and safety uh, nanotechnology. Uh, looking forward for it, and thanks for uh, thanks for giving the presentation. All right. Thanks. Thanks, Jared. Appreciate the invitation, and uh, we'll talk a little bit about what we're planning to do as a partner site. Um, and uh, so the objective of, of what we're hoping to do as a partner site is to provide instructional resources and training regarding both microtechnology and nanotechnology, health and safety. And our focus will be on workplaces, although um, we will certainly have some aspect of, of, of environmental health and safety as well. And so the two of us, uh, myself and Jim, are the, the people who will be providing this, uh, this training and the resources. Um, I'm a professor in the School of Public Health and I direct the industrial hygiene program at the University of Minnesota. I, uh, my, my background, I'm, I'm a chemical engineer uh, by training as an undergrad and I went to graduate school at the University of North Carolina for um, environmental uh, science and engineering with a, with a focus on air pollutants. So I, I did my research in airborne particle research, um, but particularly in workplaces. And I've been at the University of Minnesota now for 22 years, uh, and, and my focus has mostly been on um, uh, training related to industrial hygiene, and then uh, my research is focused mostly on airborne particles. Uh, Jim, do you want to to uh, introduce yourself. Sure, I'm uh, a senior scientist at the Nano Center, and we work with uh, both nanoparticles and also the biological aspects of nano, uh, in addition to running a clean room there. Um, I started too, I, I'm trained as a physicist and started as an aerosol guy too, and then when I entered industry, uh, they, there was much more interest in particles uh, suspended in liquids and so forth, colloids, dispersions. So that's mainly my expertise. And that's what we'll be um, adding to, to this experience. I've been at the U about, uh, geez, 11 years and spent four or five years teaching at Dakota County Technical College in our nanoscience technology program. All yours, Peter. All right, thank you. Okay, so some of you may be wondering what industrial hygiene or occupational hygiene is. So I'm going to play a little clip here uh, that from one of our videos that I narrate uh, what the definition is. The American Board of Industrial Hygiene defines industrial hygiene as the science of protecting and enhancing the health and safety of people at work and in their communities. This definition makes sense from the standpoint of protecting people at work. However, it also includes another critical aspect of occupational hygiene, the protection of people in the community who may be affected by what others do at work. Gelzer defines occupational hygiene as the science of the anticipation, recognition, evaluation, and control of hazards arising in or from the workplace and which could impair the health and well-being of workers, also taking into account the possible impact on the surrounding communities and the general environment. This second definition of occupational or industrial hygiene is more comprehensive. I also like that it includes the occupational hygiene framework of anticipating, recognizing, evaluating, and controlling hazards. We need to be able to understand when potential hazards may be present, notice them when they are there, know how to determine if they are a problem, and then do something about them if they are a problem. That gives you a little introduction to industrial or occupational hygiene. Uh, it also shows you one of the videos from the METFAST program that I'll talk about a little bit later. That's our online uh, training related to occupational hygiene as well as nanotechnology, health and safety, and other topics. So um, in, in workplace health and safety, the occupational exposures that we're interested in can come from a variety of sources, not just micro and nanotechnology. Uh, but you have a source that can potentially release materials onto surfaces or in the air. Uh, there can be transfer between those sort of buckets. Um, if it's on the, the surfaces, it's potential a, a worker could be exposed through their hands or clothing or shoes. Um, they could, uh, the, the hands uh, could touch the clothing and then the hands could also touch the face and neck. Um, pollutants in the air can be inhaled or they can deposit on clothing and then go through the same 
uh, routes as uh, things that come from surfaces. So you can get a variety of different exposures. The, probably the two biggest of concern are inhalation and dermal exposures. Uh, but inhalation exposures can also lead to ingestion exposures. So uh, things that are inhaled can deposit and then be brought up by mucus and then be swallowed. So there can be exposures in the GI tract in addition to the lungs. Uh, there can even be uh, exposures through the eyes or ocular exposures potentially. And we've learned a lot about these things. We've heard these terms um, in the public related to the COVID-19 pandemic too. So uh, jobs and products and processes that have um, risks of releases and exposures to micro nanotechnologies include production of the, the raw materials, um, medicine and nanomedicine where uh, particularly gold nanoparticles and as well as others are utilized and they're functionalized to do different medical tasks and um, medical treatments. And these functionalized nanoparticles can be toxic, for example, to chemical cells, but then what happens um, to clinicians who may be administering these or uh, environmental services workers who may have to clean up after uh, patients are in a room. So there's a risk of exposure among those workers. Um, additive manufacturing can uh, have risks of exposures. Uh, automotive repair, if they're, the plastics are reinforced with a nano uh, material, then when uh, that the damage to a vehicle must be repaired, then there's a risk of exposure there. Cosmetics and sunscreens, many of them now contain nanomaterials. Uh, micro and nanoelectronics, um, there can be abrasion and deterioration of paints and coatings, either intentional as you're, you're trying to um, uh, uh, improve a surface or deterioration due to exposure to the elements. And then leaching from clothes and food containers that contain nanomaterials. So all these pathways present risks of human exposure that we're concerned about. And this isn't an exhaustive list, of course. Um, there are risks of, uh, of health effects. So um, this graph shows uh, um, a toxicological study done in rats, where rats were, were ex presented with different um, levels of titanium dioxide um, microparticles and nanoparticles. The ultrafine uh, was about 25 nanometers in diameter. The fine titanium dioxide was about 200 nanometers. And this was done by, uh, uh, reported by Gunter Oberdorster uh, back in 2000. It's a well-known study. On the, the, so the amount of titanium dioxide is on the horizontal axis. On the vertical axis is a protein response in the lungs of rats into which these particles were deposited. And basically it shows that on a mass basis, the smaller the particle, the more, more response was, uh, was seen. And those responses can lead to toxicological effects um, in the lung. Uh, and, uh, and, and we see them in um, those types of responses when humans are exposed to particles as well. So the smaller the particle can mean the greater the risk. Also, certain types of multi-wall carbon nanotubes have been shown to behave a lot like as, um, asbestos fibers in the lungs. So these are multi-wall carbon nanotubes that are, are pretty lo relatively large, a lot of layers, uh, and um, are, are, are straight. They don't tend to fold up upon themselves. So it's certain types of carbon nanotubes, not all of them. But you can see here an image is taken of these carbon nanotubes when they're um, introduced into the lungs of mice, that they go through um, the lining of the, the lowest region of the lung, the alveoli, or even through the, the um, membrane that goes around the lungs, uh, the visceral pleura. So these are uh, present risks of exposure, and, and companies have, based on these toxicological evidence, have chosen not to get into this type of carbon nanotube production because of these results. And also there's environmental releases. So this is a study from um, Europe where, where there is a prediction of the pathways of different types of engineered nanomaterials uh, and where they would end up. 
And more than 40%, as you go to the right-hand side of the image, are predicted to end up in the environment as opposed to some sort of landfill, uh, which is uh, ultimately where m much of our products would be, would be deposited. So, you know, a lot of this will get into the environment, so there's a risk of people being exposed um, in the public as well as um, vegetation and animals. So moving on to, to what we're going to do to help instructors um, uh, be able to uh, provide training related to these health and safety issues. Um, in the School of Public Health, uh, we have a lot of resources. We, we have the Minneapolis-St. Paul Metropolitan Region, which has a lot of uh, producers of, um, and, 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 uh, of both the raw materials as well as uh, products that contain uh, engineered nanomaterials. Um, we also have in the region uh, companies who develop instrumentation to make measurements of, of uh, engineered nanomaterials. So uh, we, we benefit from that. We have other partners at the university like the Nano Center and, and departments in the College of Engineering. Um, we have, of course, our classrooms and, and technology. Um, the Public Health Institute is the time uh, is run for three weeks in May, and that may be the time that we um, potentially will host in, in uh, instructors on campus, uh, and, and possibly through that mechanism. And I'm going to talk a little bit more about our industrial hygiene laboratory and the METFAST program that I mentioned earlier. So our industrial hygiene laboratory, where we can where we can do instruction and hands-on work is about 2,500 square feet. It's a shared resource with a, another one of my faculty members, uh, my, my colleagues. We have a lot of instrumentation for measuring airborne particles, gases, vapors, dermal hazards, biological agents. And you can see from some of the images below, we have plenty of space for teaching, including desks, and, uh, and as well as for research and research training um, and, and, pro and, and doing hands-on training. So the METFAST program is a collaboration between the University of Minnesota School of Public Health, the University of Iowa College of Public Health, and Dakota County Technical College. And both Deb Newberry, who's on the, the call, and Billy Copley um, were involved when they were at DCTC in, in this project. Um, our partner at Iowa has been Tom Peters. So we're funded by the National Institute of Environmental Health Sciences and um, METFAST, uh, stands for the Midwest Emerging Technologies Public Health and Safety Training Program. Our goals, um, we've had, had two funding cycles, um, have been uh, from 2013 to 2016, we mostly were developing web-based modules about nanotechnology, health, and safety, and, and included both hour-long narrated lessons and then hands-on activity instructions. Um, from 2016 to 2021, we've been shortening our lessons, short, shorter term uh, learning assets that can be kind of digested more quickly, uh, but developing our, out our curriculum in occupational hygiene um, with emphasis on applications and examples from various emerging technologies. Um, our, the program hopes to reach a variety of participants, including our industrial hygiene graduate students at both uh, University of Minnesota and University of Iowa. Um, we've had some success reaching undergraduates and graduate science and engineering students, um, associate degree students, um, professionals interested in continuing education. So our hour-long modules are available as CE courses at the University of Minnesota. And uh, we've had a, a, a number of people take that for CE credit um, and particularly for their certifications and a variety of other learners, uh, you know, sort of whoever's interested. And we've, we've made our program available to the public too on our, our YouTube channel. So our hour long modules, um, five of them have uh, been kind of an introduction, are an introduction to occupational hygiene. Um, and then we have uh, another 14 modules, a couple of them still being developed on nanotechnology, health and safety on a variety of topics, um, ranging from recognition of hazards, evaluation of those, uh, those hazards and the risks they may present, 
and then controlling them and how to, to reduce and manage the risk. So I'm gonna give you just a little flavor of some of our instruction um, through a few videos. So this one's kind of fun. Um, it's, it's an analogy and I'll get to kind of more of, a, of what the analogy is because I can't show you the whole video, but I, I thought I'd give you a little taste here. Let's consider inertial forces now that act on a, a particle which leads to impaction, like a bug hitting the windshield of a car. The windshield causes air to move up and over the car. The force of drag will cause a small bug to follow the airflow over the car, avoiding the windshield. In contrast, a big bug, like a grasshopper, resists drag because of its inertia. If the inertia of the big bug is sufficient, it deviates away from the airflow to hit the windshield and make a big mess. This process is called inertial impaction. The concept Okay, so the idea there um, was that an analogy to, of the bugs to the particles. So relatively big particles or even microscale particles um, may not follow air streamlines as well as uh, uh, the nanoscale particles. So there's differences in how they behave. We've even heard some of this related to the, the COVID pandemic where um, small particles uh, may be able to remain in the air a lot longer and affect people farther than six feet away from each other um, versus uh, the, the big droplets that are produced by coughing um, and sneezing that, that we hope mostly fall to the floor within about six feet. So it's the same sort of mechanisms that come into play there. Um, so this inertia of the particles uh, comes into play also in, in a variety of other ways, uh, but in uh, inhalation of particles. So I'm gonna play another video here. Addition in the human respiratory tract relates particle exposures to applied doses. A particle size is the most important factor determining if and where a particle may deposit. Before we can even think about a particle depositing in the respiratory tract, we must know if a particle can even be inhaled into the tract. Because the smallest particles have little inertia, all of them move along with the air as it is inhaled to enter the respiratory tract through the nose or mouth. As we will see, most of these particles will deposit in the respiratory tract with only a small percentage being breathed back out. Medium-sized particles also tend to move along with the air and are inhaled into the respiratory tract. However, the majority of these particles fail to deposit in the respiratory tract and are exhaled back out. Large particles, which have a lot of inertia, may not follow air streamlines as the air turns to be inhaled into the nose or mouth. Some of these particles will fail to be inhaled at all. Most of those that are inhaled will deposit within the respiratory tract, but some will leave with the exhaled air. So that shows how we bring some of the concepts we try to um, teach um, using <laughs> some analogies uh, to, uh, to the real science of how particles are inhaled and deposit in the lungs. So that's an example of, you know, kind of our online training materials. Um, the next video I, I have is um, one of our, uh, our hands-on activities. So these were developed um, and, and you can access them through um, the, the Nanolink website. Um, uh, but we also have videos that demonstrate how to uh, perform the hands-on activities as an instructor. So this is our most popular one. It goes about, I think this video goes a little over three minutes. So I'm gonna play the whole thing for you to get a sense of what our hands-on activities are like. My name is Austin Bell and I am a graduate research assistant at the University of Minnesota. This is a hands-on activity demonstration of how to read and interpret SEM images. I developed this activity along with Dr. Ramachandran at the University of Minnesota and with the help of students at Dakota County Technical College. For this activity you will need SEM images printed out for each group of students, metric rulers, and computers with Microsoft Excel. 
To measure these particle size distributions, we must first collect samples. Samples are collected using air samples with filters and battery-operated pumps. During sampling, air is pulled through the filter and particles that are in the air are captured on the filter. The filter may then be viewed using a scanning electron microscope, otherwise known as an SEM. An SEM is a high-resolution microscope that is used to identify and measure nanoparticles. Because the nanoparticles are very small in size relative to the filter, we cannot observe the filter in its entirety. Instead, we look at smaller sections of the filter called fields of view. Particles in these fields of view are counted and categorized by size. These findings are then extrapolated to the entire filter. For this activity, split the class into pairs or small groups, each one with an SEM field of view similar to the image shown here. The particles are white and gray spheres and they are collected on a polycarbonate filter membrane perforated by small holes that appear black on the image. There should be approximately 20 particles on each image. Measure the scale bar with a ruler and record the value. For our example, the scale bar is measured at about 5.5 centimeters. Identify all particles in the field of view image and measure their corresponding diameters with the ruler. For the particle shown here, the diameter is about 5 centimeters. Divide the length of the particle by the length of the scale bar in order to obtain a ratio. Multiply this ratio by 200 nanometers in order to determine the diameter of the particle in nanometers. In our example, 5 divided by 5.5 equals 0 0.9. When multiplied by 200, this equates to a particle diameter of about 180 nanometers. Categorize each particle by its diameter into one of the following diameter ranges. Our first particle would be in the last diameter range for particles over 100 nanometers. Each group should categorize the rest of the particles for their particular field of view image. The class should then come together and add the distributions from all of the field of view images to the Excel sheet provided with this module. Once this is complete, you can click on the second tab on the bottom labeled Histogram Output. There you can see the first graph, which is a histogram of count fraction per micrometer versus particle size. This graph displays the distribution of particle diameters and counts visually. Here you can see that there is a left skew, meaning that there were a lot of small particles on the filter and fewer particles as the diameter increased. This lesson has Okay, and then, uh, so that's an example of our, our hands-on activities. And uh, so we've developed one for each of our, those hour-long modules. So we've got, I think, um, maybe 18 of them up online currently. Um, okay, so we have many additional hands-on activities, like I mentioned. There's one here where we look at um, powders and how they may spread and uh, looking at different size kind of microscale powders, which come in the form of flowers, and uh, F-L-O-U-R, um, and looking at different sizes and see how they spread as a function of the material, as well as how high they're dropped. Uh, we also have videos related to how different um, direct reading or real-time sampling instruments uh, measure different sizes of particles and which are good for each. We have an activity related to mapping um, levels of, of a hazard in a room. We use, uh, in person, we can do this with uh, one of our particle measuring instruments. For those who, who are using this in their own um, institutions, they can use phone apps that measure sound and have an artificial sound produced and do a map that way, which shows a lot of how occupational hygienists try to identify risks in workplaces. Um, we have a dermal uh, unit where we use a product called GlowGerm uh, to show that handling of powders uh, produces dermal exposures. We have uh, an interesting module where students use vacuum cleaners and uh, uh, plastic uh, duct uh, as well as a wizard stick to produce particles and see how, how ventilation can help manage uh, risks of exposure. And then we have one on respiratory protection and personal protective equipment as well. So application of our content, we've uh, got a course, an academic course, a nanotechnology health and safety at the University of Minnesota. University of Iowa has incorporated the various lessons into existing courses primarily. 
our continuing education I mentioned before. Um, the audience has included certified industrial hygienists, certified safety professionals, certified hazardous material managers, occupational health nurses, and, and professional engineers who need um, additional training for certification. Early in the pandemic, when people were at home, we had a lot, uh, a, a real bump in usage of our materials. And then we have our YouTube channel where I extracted the videos I've shown, uh, the, the NanoLink program, which uh, the, the website still exists, also has these materials. And then we have a, a website for METFAST that's still under development, but some of the materials are up there as well. So uh, the second portion of our offering will kind of expand on some of the uh, theoretical basis that uh, Pete will be giving. And we'll be going into the uh, nanomaterials lab to work more with dispersions, colloids, and suspensions uh, to kind of augment what uh, Pete will be covering with uh, nanoparticle aer and, and aerosols in a suspended form. And we'll spend some time uh, getting people familiar with the ways to characterize nanoparticle properties. And uh, then wrap that up with a little bit of an exposure to working in the area of biological nanoparticles, which is a very hot emerging area in applied nano. So working safely with nanomaterials, of course, uh, Pete's outlined the, the issues with occupational exposure to airborne uh, particles. And those are typically the encountered in a lot of different industries where you're grinding uh, a bulk material down to smaller particles or classifying them to size or making aerosols through gas phase reactions like people make uh, carbon black or, or fume silica. Uh, in addition, though, there's the, the, the dispersion area where most of the hazards enter through wet chemistry, through chemical exposure. So we will be uh, focusing uh, our participants' uh, attention on treating uh, how to handle hazardous chemical precursors if you want to make these particles in a wet chemistry method, uh, working with uh, highly uh, acidic or basic solutions, Flammable and harm, harmful solvents come into play in the synthesis of a number of different types of nanoparticles. And so these are some inhalation, but more, more dermal and more eye exposure uh, situations here. So the uh, participants will have pr produce, synthesize uh, one of several different uh, commercially important types of nanoparticles. Uh, I have some examples there. Uh, organic nanoparticles are, are, are used in paints and coatings and pigments, polymeric uh, man nanoparticles, a lot of use for uh, medical applications, metallic particles like gold and silver nanoparticles, uh, ceramics that are used in the uh, abrasives industry as well as all kinds of coatings. These are all uh, commercially important. We expect our technicians to run into them if they go into certain chemi uh, chemical manufacturing or, or other types of industries. So we'll have them uh, carefully review the reaction and the reagents involved, look at safety, look at the uh, material safety data sheets and how to read those, uh, synthesize one or more batches and then characterize them mostly for their properties, uh, including size, size distribution and some other properties that we'll get into. Uh, and then paying attention to the other end of the process, I think uh, nanotechnicians need to be aware of if they're running a lab or working with a lab, how do you get rid of this stuff? It turns out it's not that easy. You can't, you can't dispose of many of these materials in just normal uh, waste streams. Uh, people working in this field need to be uh, aware of state and local regulations for disposal. And so we'll, we'll touch on, on some of that. And because in, in, uh, sometimes, especially if they're working for a small startup company, they're gonna have to set these waste streams up. They're going to have from, from scratch and learn how to properly handle the waste material. So we'll, we'll uh, do a bit of a review on that. And then uh, much of our work will be in characterizing what we've made and kind of identifying the problem. Uh, if you step into an analytical lab role or a quality control uh, uh, task role, uh, we need to, they need to understand what needs to be measured, how you'd measure it, what tools are to be used, what the samples look like, how they need to be handled. And then, um, you know, maybe uh, we'd like to impart some fundamental knowledge in this area. Not everybody's going to be an expert particle scientist at the end, but uh, we'd like to give people the tools to, to know how to operate or, or even learn more. So just a definition here. When we talk about particles and analyzing particles, we have to kind of identify what the physical form of the particle is and what it's uh, dispersed or suspended in. So you can see the common, common names for these things that I've collected here. Uh, the solid particles in air, uh, that's, that's the um, area of METFAST and, and Pete's laboratory has a lot of really good in, uh, equipment 
instrumentation for analyzing aerosols and dry powders. In the other world, the liquid particles suspended in air or liquid all have their widespread applications in different fields. We won't touch upon them too much, but you find a lot of this in cosmetic personal care, food processing, uh, nutraceuticals and so forth, spray drying of uh, dairy products, which is very big in the Midwest. But we'll be focusing on the uh, lower left-hand corner of that, gra or that uh, plot there, solid particles in liquids suspended go by various names of colloids, dispersions, or particle suspensions. And we're going to analyze them primarily for their sizes. As, as uh, Pete pointed out, a particle size uh, uh, will radically affect how it behaves in a given environment, in a fluid environment. So oftentimes that's the biggest thing that you are worried about uh, analyzing and providing to other people on your team. We also might be interested in uh, uh, counting particles, getting a concentration number, Particle shape uh, turns out to be important for some applications uh, for like ground materials. If you want to compact it down into uh, uh, compact a powder into a small pellet or something, that shape will uh, play a great deal of, of, of impact or will impact how things uh, compress. We'll also talk about something called zeta potential. That's the electrostatic charge that sets up on most particles that are suspended in a polar liquid like water or in some cases, alcohols. So it turns out to be very important in a number of industries. Chemical composition is also important, but we are uh, not, not set up to do too much of that, so we're going to leave that alone. But if there's time, we'll do some UV uh, vis uh, spectroscopy for, for composition as well. So oftentimes, if a, if a technician is working in a, in a manufacturing plant or a, a research and development laboratory, uh, someone comes to them and says, what's my particle size? And uh, what we want to get across here is that there is usually no one size, unless you've made them perfectly uh, what's called monodisperse, and you've taken great pains to make them all uniform like that picture shows. Typically, they'll be spread out over a wide size range, sometimes um, uh, orders of magnitude size range. So getting people to understand the language of distributions and the measures of distributions is one of the first things we want to cover as we move from a single size to a distribution, we need to bring in some of the statistical concepts of curves, median, mode, uh, mean, uh, other measures that are commonly used in the industry, uh, D10 and D90. D10 is a diameter at which 10% of the particles are smaller, the rest are bigger, and then D90 uh, is, is defined analogously. So getting to understand those numbers, and then in, uh, in addition, and I'm not gonna go into this in too much detail, but there are a number of ways to plot the data. You can plot a histogram uh, like uh, the METFAST exercise or uh, like this picture is here of number. How many, how many particles did you find in each size channel? Oftentimes, though, that's not what you're interested in. You want to know where your product ended up if you're grinding something or making something. So where is the most volume or mass of the material? So volume-weighted versus number-weighted distributions. We'll introduce students to that. And then to uh, get them onto some of the techniques that we'll uh, uh, outline. So a real common way of analyzing uh, size distribution of particles in dispersions or suspensions is laser diffraction. Uh, this is a technology that's an in, kind of an indirect way of measuring things. And it's kind of uh, curious. Light is, laser light is directed, on, or directed onto a large number of particles in suspension, typically flowing through a liquid flow cell. Each particle is going to make a diffraction pattern. You know, just like your physics experiment, when you pass laser light through a little slit, you've got diffraction fringes. A solid particle sitting in front of a laser will do that too. What you get in this system is the combined patterns of many millions, not millions, probably thousands of particles, all superimposed on one another. So you get the image kind of on the right-hand side of the screen. You might ask now, how can I possibly extract useful information when all of the effects of each particle are overlaid on top of each other. This is um, a process called uh, inversion. So inversion will start, it's a, it's a, process, a data processing uh, regime where you take a model size distribution, assume one, and create a synthetic pattern. And you compare that with what you actually measured. And of course they won't match because you just took a guess at first, but with this, uh, but understanding how it diverges from the actual pattern, you can adjust your, your Im initial guess and do that over and over again in an iterative fashion until you finally have a distribution of particles that very convincingly make up a pattern that matches what you measured. 
So this is one of the key things we would like to get across to students. This is an indirect estimate of particle size distribution. It's not like taking a ruler in the METFAST uh, exercise on an SEM photo and measuring each one and, and making a histogram. It's a a uh, process that gives you a very, very good estimate, but you didn't actually measure them all. Now, the advantage here, though, is that the counting statistics are so much better. You're measuring thousands upon thousands of particles uh, to get much better uh, examination of the whole sample. It's hard to measure thousands upon thousands of uh, particle images with a ruler. You know, I, I get tired after about 50 or 60. Uh, another technique we'll be going over is dynamic light scattering. This is the workhorse for people working with nanoparticles. It, it too is a light scattering uh, procedure that works on an ensemble basis. You're looking at a whole lot of particles. In this case, a laser is uh, directed onto a system of uh, particles between two, uh, six, na six microns all the way down to two nanometers, you know, essentially big atomic clusters. Uh, those particles are in constant motion due to Brownian motion. And if we shine a laser light at it and collect the scattered pattern, that pattern will change from one microsecond to the next. So we can actually determine how small the particles are by watching how quickly the pattern changes. So uh, small particles are going to be moving more rapidly, obviously. Bigger particles are going to be more slowly moving, slowly changing pattern. You can actually, this is a pretty coarse measurement, so it's been uh, refined with other information, particularly Doppler shifting of the scattered light. Is the, is the particle moving away or towards you, fast or slow? With that additional information, you can, again, use an inversion process to get a size distribution. And uh, very, very accurate. Sometimes, I'm, as I mentioned, we're interested in particle shape. So we have an automated shape analyzer. Now, uh, you may be interested in this to quantify these different shapes, and there's a number of different quantification schemes that are out there. You may be just interested in seeing how spherical or non-spherical your particles are because you're interested in packing them together. Pharmaceutical uh, drug powders, for instance, are really uh, subject to different um, packaging or packing characteristics when you're pelletizing or making pills out of, out of powders. So this is something that we'll uh, briefly expose students to. Uh, a newer technology that we'll uh, be teaching is the uh, nanoparticle tracking analysis, which is um, heavily used by folks working in uh, cells, cell components, exosomes, liposomes, things like that. It doesn't have a very wide range. It goes from 20 nanometers up to about a micron. And it does rely upon uh, Brownian motion. So here you see that there's a kind of a simple optical microscope on the left, but mounted on the stage is a powerful laser that's used to uh, pass, pass a short wavelength laser through the collection of particles on the screen there uh, in, the, in that cell. Those particles are too small to image, certainly not with a simple microscope like this one, but it's the, the particles will scatter off enough light for the laser or the microscope to see where they are and their position. So if we then take a video of these particles moving in Brownian motion, we get something like this. Taking that image and analyzing it frame by frame gives us the diffusivity, the uh, root mean square distance that these things have moved over a given unit of time. By the Stokes-Einstein equation, you can relate that directly to particle radius if you know a few things, like the viscosity of your surrounding liquid. So this, uh, this technique is uh, seeing widespread use and expanding use, so we'll definitely want to expose uh, our, the participants to this. Uh, I mentioned zeta potential. Zeta potential is the fact that most uh, suspended particles, particularly in a polar medium like water, will acquire a surface charge. They'll acquire a surface charge because certain groups are dissolving from the surface of the particle or maybe adsorbing from the surrounding uh, liquid solution. But in any case, those particles acquire a charge, and it turns out it's really important to understand that charge because it's what keeps the particles stable. If you are making a dispersion or a, a suspension of particles, typically you want those things to stay uh, well suspended so that when you apply it, uh, it doesn't, uh, it's not all separated. Uh, the charge, the surface charge on the top of the particle surface uh, plays a key role in that. If they're all like charge, they repel each other electrostatically and they don't get close enough to agglomerate and start sticking and getting big enough so that they settle out under gravity. So control of zeta potential is very important in uh, 
foods, pharmaceuticals, uh, cosmetic, personal care uh, uh, fields. And then lastly, we'll uh, have them take a go on this machine. This machine doesn't use light scattering at all. Instead, it's got a small little pore, a little hole in a plastic membrane, and the, we suspend our particles in an electrolyte like uh, saline. And so one can detect the charge flow through that uh, pore pretty accurately. And then as soon as a particle is pushed through there, there's a big pulse in the detected um, current. And so from that pulse, we can determine particle size, particle zeta potential, and actually count them as they go by. So we get uh, information on concentration. It's a wonderful tool in theory, devilishly difficult to operate. So we'll probably see how far we get and see if we, too many, uh, we, have, we can get some students to work on this one. But it is uh, also a, a recent tool that's finding its way into more labs. So now shifting over to the, the nano bio or the biological applications of nanotechnology. Uh, it, it, oftentimes when I was placing students, I, I found that uh, they, they've got a pretty good background in the physical science based applications of nanotechnology, micro device fabrication or thin film deposition or, or characterization. But some of them ended up getting jobs at medical device companies where they were thrown into this world of the squishy stuff, right? Cells, tissues, and, and blood, and, and fluids. So here, uh, this is a case for, uh, for preparing some students in these areas if you, if you are not already including that in your curricula. Uh, in, in addition, there's a, it's people placed in companies that are actually actively developing new nanobio products or, or uh, biological applications of nano, for instance, Nanoparticle drug delivery uh, platforms are, are uh, rapidly being approved uh, by the FDA for use. Paclitaxel is a, is a common one that's been around for a while. Uh, thermal therapies. Uh, people are experimenting with iron oxide particles that can be injected into a patient and then heated by an externally applied energy source like radio waves. So these uh, can be used to cauterize or remove unwanted tissue. Of course, you need to have them in the right place. You want to make sure you got them all right, uh, right where you need them. But it, uh, this is a, a, a therapy or a therapy regime that it is is moving more towards um, approval and use, and other other areas where uh, nanoparticles are used in life science applications like environmental remediation or cell sorting. So, uh, we uh, are going to strive to provide the participants with. Um, some experience in these practical aspects. First of all, biosafety levels. What do they mean? You know, what, uh, how, how do we gauge the relative risk of different microorganisms and how it, the, do workers uh, need to protect themselves and, and uh, their environment for, for these uh, uh, microbes of different biosafety levels? Um, and then identifying the safe use. Uh, our facility is BSF Biosafety Level 2, uh, so uh, we want to go over some of the uh, use uh, of the facilities that are required for this, like a biosafety cabinet, proper use of uh, uh, personal protective equipment, and so forth. And then, uh, and this is a this is always a, a discovery for people who did not have a biology background. Growing cells, culturing cells, you know, culturing bacteria is pretty easily easily done. Uh, culturing eukaryotic cells, like mammalian cells or human cell lines is uh, it's a learning experience for most of us. And so if uh, we're going to give people just a little bit of experience in, in, the, in the right way and the pitfalls of trying to culture the cells that you want so that you don't get uh, a Petri dish full of things you don't want at all. And then, um, uh, again, at the end, you, you, a lab worker needs to be conversant with uh, the end of the process. Uh, biological waste needs to be handled in certain ways. And then biology or biological waste, like cells that have had nanoparticles added to them, uh, assume a different level of regulatory oversight and have to be handled in a different way altogether. So these are all things, uh, topics that we hope to touch upon and at least expose uh, the students participating in this, uh, this uh, class too. So I believe that's it. Uh, Pete, you wanna wrap it up? Sure. Thanks, Jim. Um, so, so our training plan for in instructors is that we, we, you know, we'll, we'll see, but the idea is to have uh, next starting next summer, uh, people to the University of Minnesota campus into the industrial hygiene lab and the nano center labs. Um, 
for kind of an intensive 32 hour training program over four days. Uh, the topics would include both the, the micro and nanotechnology health and safety fundamentals, some of the things we touched upon here. Um, in particular, kind of the controlling exposure, I, I think in, in the chat, um, I, I mentioned that, you know, that's something that may be really important for those in the community college programs because they, you know, they could be tasked with health and safety in their, their laboratories or their workplaces that they go to after um, completing your program. Um, so that that could be uh, very important for them. And then uh, also the the safety applications, some of the things that that Jim was just describing uh, would also be part of that four day program. Um, so that's what we hope to do in person if if we um, you know if the pandemic does not allow us to have something in person next uh, summer, uh, we would figure out a way to do something um, virtually uh, remotely. And I think that's pretty much what we had. All right. Thanks. That was awesome.